Good morning, everyone. We are continuing our series on Love God by Worshiping, a church on its knees. We have booklets available. If you like one, raise your hand. They'll, they'll give you one. Our mission statement is love God, love others, impact the world. Love God by worshiping. Love others by belonging, being part of a care group. Uh, impact the world by serving. That's our mission statement in our church. And this month, I want to focus on this whole idea of, of worship. Corporate prayer, but corporate prayer that seeks the face of God before it seeks his hand. Uh, three ingredients of successful corporate worship, according to Daniel Henderson, it has to be scripture-fed. It must be spirit-led, and it should be worship-based. Uh, the whole idea is what's found in Psalm 27, 8, when God says, You have said, Seek my face. And David says, My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. We want to be that generation that Psalm 24, 6 speaks of. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. So when we talk about God's face and God's hand, of course, God is invisible. We are simply using these illustrations or these uh, figures to demonstrate what God does for us. Uh, again, in uh, Daniel Henderson's book, Fresh Encounter, he says, in general, his hand refers to what he does for me. Now, we are fed because of his good hand. His face is who he is to me. That speaks of the, the praise that we ascribe to God for who he is. Uh, I'm going to introduce another book. I didn't mention it last week, but one of the books that I, I've been reading is Timothy Keller, uh, Prayer, his book on prayer, Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God. And he says the same thing in, in, his, in his book. He says, Paul, the Apostle Paul, does not see prayer as merely a way to get things from God, but as a way to get more of God himself. And so I want us to encourage to, to pray together, but not just to ask God, that when we come together to pray, the, the majority of our time is to seek God's face. It is to worship God. It is to ascribe to him the worth that is due him. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7, and we will look at the priority of prayer in the life of the early church. But before we do that, let's look to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is through him that we're able to offer up sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that he is truly what needs to be central in everything that we do. And we pray, Father, that you would remind us of that as we look into your word. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. According to the Center for Disease Control, each day in the United States, approximately nine people are killed and more than 1,000 injured in crashes that are involved in distracted driving. You know that? Nine people die each day. And a thousand injured because people are texting while driving, because people are drinking coffee and eating, putting on makeup while driving. <laughs> and it's dangerous. It's serious. It's dangerous to, to drive while you are distracted. I, sometimes I even see people reading newspapers, you know that? While driving. I've seen that. I go, wow. But just as distracted Driving is dangerous. Being distracted in the ministry is equally dangerous. Satan, one of the things Satan does is to distract his workers or the workers of, of God from, from praying. He likes to distract us from keeping the main thing the main thing. Uh, Daniel Henderson in his book says, I often say that the devil does not have to destroy a Christian leader. He only has to distract him. Over time, that distraction will grow like cancer in an internal organ until it drains the effectiveness of a minister through discouragement, delusion, and despondency. Uh, do we keep the main thing the main thing? One of, say, one of the things Satan wants to do is to move us away from what is truly important. In the passage that we will look at, you find that Satan wanted to distract the early church. It was growing. 
And so to destroy it, one of the things he did was, one, to sow seeds of division, but secondly, to try to distract the apostles from doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so in verse 1 of our text, it says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in numbers, notice the church was growing tremendously, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. One of Satan's tricks or one of Satan's weapons is to divide the church. And so in the busyness of what they were doing, remember thousands of people coming to the Lord, those who had means were selling their lands and possessions so that everyone could have it. But as they were distributing the food, as they were distributing the resources, the Greek-speaking Jews were being accidentally neglected. Inadvertently, they were not getting what they were supposed to be getting. And so they complained to the apostles. By the way, complaining in itself is not bad, but if the apostles had not been wise, they could have let it fester. They could have let it turn into division. Uh, that's one of Satan's tricks. You can't, he can't destroy the church from the outside. Whenever persecution comes to the church, guess what? It just purifies the church. And the church will grow even more. But the way that Satan destroys his church is from the inside. With petty bickerings, with unforgiveness, with resentments. That's how he destroys a church from the inside. But not only does he try to divide, he tries to distract, but God gave the apostles wisdom. Notice what happened in verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word, to, the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, and we will appoint that we whom we will appoint to this duty. Verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So instead of Satan dividing the church, instead of Satan distracting the apostles, God gave wisdom to the leadership of the church, to the apostles, so that they would affirm what is priority, what is important in the life of the church. The problem many times, not only in the church, but in our lives, is we so easily get distracted. Especially so in the culture that we live in. Why? Because we have so many things that we could devote our time to. Let me give you some examples. For instance, now we're able to, to stream the latest movies and stream uh, the latest series. Some people, they intentionally not watch a series so that they could binge watch and watch for 20 hours straight. Not only do we stream the latest movies, we, we, we stream even foreign movies. Foreign Korean dramas. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Well, you have to read the subtitle and you read that for hours. You're reading the subtitles. And you could stream it anywhere, anytime. You could be on bar, you could be at a restaurant, you could be at a birthday party that you don't want to be in and you're just watching, you know, earphones, right? And if it's not movies and dramas and TVs, it's sports. Whether it's the Giants or the 49ers or the Raiders or the A's or the Sharks or our favorite team, the Warriors. How many hours do we spend not only watching but preparing the snacks so that when people come, <laughs> we're eating the chips and we're eating whatever it is. And if it's not sports, it's while we're watching sports, we're posting on Facebook and on Instagram and we're tweeting out you know, our sayings and retweeting what people say. And if it's not social media, it's hobbies that we're involved in. 
Now, whether it's bowling or fishing or tennis or golf or bike riding, ouch. <laughs> or video games, double ouch <laughs> for some of you. And if it's not this, the latest movies, it's not enough to stream it. We have to see it on the big screen with the popcorn and, and everything. You know, the Century Theater, we're always there when the latest uh, Transformer movie or Marvel movie comes out. Now, th by the way, did I miss anything? <laughs> I think I covered most of it, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with any of these things. I watch movies. I ride my bike. I, I go fishing. There's nothing wrong with that per se. But if you have, you spend all your time doing these things and you never have time to pray and you never have time to read your Bible and you never have time to go to church and you never have time to go to prayer meeting or care group ministry, then your priorities are misplaced. You're living a distracted life. And so Satan doesn't have to destroy you. He simply has to distract you. And there's so many things that can distract us. But one of the most insidious distractions is ministry itself. You and I could be so busy working for God that we forget God. Again, Daniel Henderson says, What opposes the pastor's life of prayer more than anything? The ministry. It's not shopping or car repairs or sickness or yard work that squeezes out prayer into hurried corners of the day. It is budget developments and staff meetings and visitation and counseling and answering mail and writing reports and reading journals and answering the phone and preparing messages. Sometimes we're so busy with ministry that we forget the person that we're doing it for. We forget God. We forget to spend time on our knees in prayer. In the passage that we've read, three priorities that we must hold sacred, three things that we must keep the main thing in our church. If we're going to grow, if we're going to continue to mature, not only in the church, but in our Christian life. First of all, the dedication to the word of God, the dedication to preaching. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And the twelve summoned the number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. It's not wrong to help the poor. It's not wrong to help the widows. But the, the apostle was saying that our priority must be in preaching the word of God. And in verse 4, they say the same thing. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The early church was devoted and dedicated to hearing the word of God preached and, and, and taught. And it says in Acts 2.42, remember last week? This was our passage. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. When Jesus was here on earth, when he was praying for you and for me, when he was praying for the future church, this is what he asked the Father. He says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. In other words, if we're going to develop spiritually, if there's going to be spiritual transformation in our lives, Jesus says primary, central to that, is the Word of God. It is the truth of God's Word. The Christian life is a battle for truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so Jesus prayed for you and for me. He says, he, he says to the Father, Father, Help them keep the main thing, the main thing. Sanctify them in the truth. Why? Because your word is truth. When the Apostle Paul was writing to this young pastor of the church of Ephesus, this great church in Ephesus, this is what he says to Timothy. He says, Timothy, there will come a time when people will not stand for, for, for sound doctrine. He says, but you, Timothy, you continue to keep the main thing, the main thing. He says, preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season, whether people want to hear it or not. He says, preach, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. He says, don't ever 
Remove the centrality of preaching from your ministry, Timothy. Regardless of how people regard it. He says, keep preaching the word. I like uh, what Elmer Town says. And when, when I was uh, studying for my dissertation, one of the books I read was Elmer Town's The Every, Every Church Guide to Growth. And he says this, and it's interesting because they did a study of about 300 churches, of churches that are dying and churches that are growing. And, and they saw a lot of uh, factors in it, but this is one of the main factors. He says, one of the most significant differences was discovered when we asked the pastors, how much time on the average do you spend on sermon preparation per sermon each week? And notice the difference between churches that were dying and churches that were growing. The pastors of the non-growing churches average slightly over two hours of preparation time per sermon. The pastors in high conversion growth churches average 10 hours per sermon each week. And so what is it that keeps the church healthy? It is the high regard of the pastors for the word of God. When I was in seminary, Daryl Bach, who, by the way, wrote one of the best commentaries on Acts. He was one of my first preaching professors. This is what he said. Study one hour for every minute you speak. And I said, what? <laughs> I didn't follow that. He's never been a pastor. <laughs> that, means, that means if you preach for 40 minutes, you have to study 40 hours. So that, that's, not, that's a little unrealistic. But what's the point? Why did he say that? Because we need to have a high regard for the preaching of the word of God. So whenever you, you, you're up here to preach, don't wing it. Don't just say something. Have something to say. Have something to say because you've studied. Because you have poured over the text and asked God, God, what does this mean? God, how does it apply to the people? Now, one of my favorite professors, Dr. Anthony Evans, said, there's never an excuse for a bad sermon. No excuse for a bad sermon. And so you need to put time into to the study of the Word of God. I'm blessed because I grew up with, with men, godly men, who modeled for me what it means or what it takes to preach and, and teach effectively. I remember Pastor Bert, um, well, he was Kuya Bert when, when I was growing up. He was my he was my youth leader. And whenever I would sit under his, his teaching in Sunday school, I was always so impressed how, how prepared he was. He was always so prepared. He, he knew the text. He knew the background. He knew how it applies. And, and so one time I asked him, uh, Kuyabert, when do you start studying for your, for your Sunday school lesson? And I was expecting him to say, oh, Thursday, Friday. He goes, Oh, you mean if I'm going to teach next Sunday again? I go, yeah, and it was a Sunday. He goes, tonight. Oh, you start studying a week before? Uh-huh. He goes, and I study every day. And he modeled for me what it means to make the word of God uh, primary in the lives of people. The high regard for God's word. And my dad, of course, even though he'd been in the, the ministry for years, I would always see him pour over the, the Bible, pour over commentaries, and he would write out his, his sermon word for word. You know, he didn't have a computer. He would just write it out. And he would have pages of written notes. And so if we're going to grow in our Christian life, if we're going to grow as a church, then there must be dedication to the Word of God. Amen? Okay. Secondly, there must be delegation of personnel. In other words, the people in the church must use their spiritual gifts to serve. Now, what is our, our mission statement? The last part is impact the world by serving. And so in verse 3, it says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good re repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. They picked men, not only men who were skilled, but men who were godly. Notice the characteristics of these men. First of all, they chose men of good repute. In other words, they had a good reputation among people. In other words, if, if you were to ask people about them, they, they, would, they would say, yeah, that, that guy is a godly man. They're, they're, 
their talk matched their walk, in other words. And so these were men who had a good reputation. They had a good track record among the believers. Not only that, it says they were full of the Spirit. It means it was the Holy Spirit who controlled them. It was the Holy Spirit who guided them. It was the Holy Spirit who gave them power. It was the Holy Spirit that made a difference in how they live so that when they talked to you, when they walked among you, they displayed Christ-like characteristics. They displayed the fruit of the Spirit. They were good repute. They were full of the Spirit. And guess what? They were also full of wisdom. That means they not only knew what to do, they knew how to do it in practical ways. It's not only doing the right thing, it's doing it in the right way, in the right manner. And what's interesting about these, these men is that they were all Greeks. The apostles knew that the men who would best fill and meet the needs of the Greek-speaking Jews were those who understood them. And so when they appointed them, notice, all the names of the men, the seven men, are Greek names. It says, and what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. They, they mentioned Stephen and Philip first because they would be instrumental in chapter 6, in chapter, I mean, in chapter 7, in chapter 8, in the expansion of God's, God's kingdom. And then they, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, another characteristic. What does that mean? It means Stephen had, had a, a deep faith in God that he had a, a deep trust in what God is doing. He was a man of conviction. Why? Because he believed what God said he would do. He was also the first martyr in the church. It says, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, where Lion King gets it from, I guess, <laughs> and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte, a proselyte of Antioch, and so these were, these were men who were not only skilled in what they did, but they were godly. First and foremost, they were men of character. How do we apply that? Well, as a church, if we're going to grow, then we need to make sure that we are using our spiritual gifts in service. That, that it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how big the church is if people are not serving it is a church that's weak. It is a church that's unhealthy. It is a church that's handicapped. Let me give you an example. Who are some of the best athletes in the world? NBA players. I mean, they, they are like gazelles when they run back and forth. It's just amazing how good they are. But what happens when they tear an ACL or like Bo Boogie Cousins? He, he ruptured his uh, Achilles uh, tendons. What happens to him? He's on the shelf. In spite of the fact that he's strong, he could bench press, he, he could bench press us, our weight. You know, we, we just, he's just so strong and he, he's so agile, he's so skillful. But when he has an injury, when just a small part, compared to how big he is, when just a small part doesn't work, what does he do? You see him in a boot. He's limping. It doesn't matter how big a church is. If parts are not working, that church is limping. And don't say, well, Pastor, you know, I, I don't really do much. I just do a very small part. I don't, I'm not that talented. I'm not that gifted. It doesn't matter. Because even a small part can handicap a church. God placed you in this church for a reason, for a purpose. God placed you in this church because you have a gift. You have an ability that only you can do. And if you don't do it, no one else will. The church walks with a limp. And so here we find that they chose men, and these men served so that the church continued to be healthy, the church continued to grow. Here's something else that I want us to do as a church. is be in the habit of praying for, for our workers. It says, these they set before the apostles, and guess what? They what? Prayed and lay their hands on them. Before the whole congregation, before the, the Christians in Jerusalem, 
they affirm that these are the men that we want to serve in this capacity. And they prayed for them. Do we pray for our workers? Or do we simply complain? No, before you complain about anything that's not going right in this church, my, my challenge to you is to be in prayer for them. And not just complain, oh, I didn't like the snacks today. <laughs> oh, I, didn't, I didn't like the sound. I didn't like the music. The message is too long. Man, uh, Sunday school teacher didn't teach my kids correctly today. How do you pray for them? That's my question. Have you prayed for the Sunday school teacher? Some, you know, Sunday school teachers are human too. You know, they, they have bad days. They have... Maybe they were sick the whole week. Maybe they fought with their spouse or the, the boss gave them a hard time. And yet they're, they're there today. They're here today. Why? Because they love you. Because they love your children. Because they love the Lord. And if the, the, they don't have everything correct downstairs, my question, have you prayed for them? Oh, maybe the sermon is not really speaking to you. But my question, have you prayed for me? Have you prayed for the ushers? Sometimes you think, oh, man, that usher was grouchy today. <laughs> he didn't shake my hand. He didn't smile. <laughs> Did you smile at him? <laughs> Did you pray for him? Maybe he's battling cancer. We don't know. And so we need to pray for our workers. We want this church to be healthy. Not only serve, but pray for one another. Amen? Let's move on. What's interesting about the principles that you find in Acts chapter 6 is the very principles that you find in Exodus chapter 18. This, this whole principle of not only delegation, but the other two that we will talk about is also found in Exodus 18. Remember when Moses was trying to judge the cases of two and a half million people? And from sunrise to sundown, he was, he was adjudicating these cases. And Jethro, his father-in-law, by the way, Jethro's other name is Rule. That's where I get my name from. And Jethro observed him, and he said, you're going to burn yourself out. And so he, given, he gives him an advice. And in this advice, the very three priorities that we're, we, we emphasize today is the very three priorities that he tells Moses. Notice what he says. Now obey my voice, I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. So what's priority? Prayer. Pray. Pray for your people. Secondly, he says, you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Secondly, what? Preach or teach. Preach the word. And then what? Delegate. The third thing, delegate. It says, moreover, look for able men, those who are skillful, for all the people who fear God, godly, skillful men. Not just their ability, but their character. He says, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. The three priorities that, we, that, that are in Acts, first of all, what? Preach. Secondly, delegate. And then third, pray. And that's what our, our third, our third uh, principle or our third priority that we want to talk about. So how, how could we be healthy? How could we grow as a church? There must be dedication to the preaching of God's word. There must be delegation of godly personnel. Finally, there must be devotion to prayer. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 4. So the disciple says, we need to keep the main thing, the main thing, assign these men to, to do these things for us, but we will devote ourselves first and foremost to what? We will devote ourselves to prayer. Where did the disciples get this from? Why is it that they knew that prayer was key to a successful and healthy and God-glorifying ministry? You know who they learned it from? Jesus, exactly. If you look at Luke, the very same one who wrote the book of Acts, and you see how he talks about Jesus, you will see a, a, a consistent theme. 
Okay, I'll just show you from, from verses in Luke, the same author of Acts, Dr. Luke. He says in Luke 5.16, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Jesus, very early in his ministry, made it a habit to go alone to desolate places so that he could be alone to pray. Luke chapter 6, 12, before he picked the apostles, notice what he did. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. He prayed all night. He gave up sleep. Why? Because he was praying for who would be the leaders of the church. Luke 9, 18, it says, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who did the crowd say I am? In Luke chapter 9, 28, now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. This was the Mount of Transfiguration where he, he temporarily showed them his glory. And it says that, that light leaped out from him, uh, according to the text. As he went there to what? To pray. Luke 11, it says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. So here the disciples are, were already seeing the pattern in Jesus' life. And they knew that was the secret to Jesus' power. That's why they didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to do miracles. What did he say? Lord, teach us to, to pray. And as Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer, says, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. When you pray, not if you pray, but what? When you pray. What is Jesus' expectation of the church? That they would pray. Luke eleven nineteen, he says, And I tell you, ask, and in the Greek, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek, in the Greek, keep on seeking and you will find. Knock, in the Greek, keep on knocking, it will be open to you. Jesus says, don't get tired of praying. Why? Because God listens. He sees, and he will answer. So keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Luke twenty two thirty nine. 39, the night he was betrayed, when he knew that Judas was going to betray him in the garden, what did he do? And he came out and as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. By the way, we were able to visit that, that place. It's just such a, such a sacred place when you go to that, that, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he prayed that evening. When he was finally arrested and crucified, what did he do on the cross? Was it, the, do, you ever, do you ever think about it? What did he do on the cross? He prayed. And Jesus said what? Father, he was praying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. In the Greek, he kept on praying this. It was not just one time that he prayed. He kept saying, Father, forgive them. So much so that one of the thieves, who at first was making fun of him in Matthew, all of a sudden, when he saw the difference in, in Jesus, that this person was being convicted, for a crime that he didn't commit, was saying instead of being bitter, instead of cursing, instead of being mad, he says, Father, forgive them. But one of them was said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. But again in Luke, not only do you begin the scene at the cross with Jesus praying, you end the scene at the cross with Jesus praying. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, all the way to the end and up to the cross, Jesus was what? He was praying. No wonder the disciples when they began their ministry, said, we will not be distracted. We will devote ourselves to the preaching of God's word. And what? And to prayer. We will devote ourselves to prayer. You know, when I was studying, um, right, well, let me just say this first. And the reason that God continued to bless the church was because their priorities were correct. 
That's why it says in Acts 6, 7, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the, the faith. Even the Jewish priests began to be converted. Why? Because the church's priority was correct. They put a priority in the Word of God. They put a priority in serving. And they put a priority in praying. One of the things that, that highly convicted me when I, when, I, when I was studying this is what Jesus said when he cleansed the temple. The second time he cleansed the temple, when he first started ministry, he cleansed it, remember, in, in John chapter 2. He says, what authority? Who, who gives you the right to do this? He has destroyed this, this temple on the third day. I will, I will raise it up. And he was talking about the, the resurrection. But, but after that, of course, the people came back in. After he left, the, all the, the money changers and the, those who were selling livestock, they, they filtered back in. And they filled the, the court of the Gentiles. As he was about to end his ministry, the last time he goes into Jerusalem, he again cleans the temple. And it is what he said that, that cut my heart. He says, and, the, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and brought into the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seat of those who sold pigeons. And this is what he said. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of what? A house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. But even more convicting than that is what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse. When on the night, his last night here on earth, when he was about to be um, betrayed and, 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 and arrested and tried and crucified, he was telling the, the disciples, you see that temple, that magnificent temple, they were up in the Mount of Olives. He says, not one stone will be left standing on each other. He was talking about the destruction of Israel in AD 70 under Titus, the Roman commander. If Jesus said that, it said about AD 30. And Titus destroyed the temple in AD 70. There was 40 years of continually doing the same thing. But notice what he says, what Jesus says about this ministry. He says in verse 38, this is during the Olivet Discourse, he says, see what? Your house is left to you desolate. Do you get that? Jesus says, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And for 40 years, the same sacrifices occurred. For 40 years, the same, the, the giving continued. For 40 years, the selling continued. And all along in those 40 years, Jesus was saying, that is not my house. That is your house. And it will be left to you desolate. You know, I don't know about you, when I hear that, it, it puts a fear in my heart. Because you could be busy, and we're in our 29th year of ministry going on our 30th year anniversary this November. But in all those years of ministry, could Jesus say, this is my house? Or will he simply say after 30 years, that is your house? I know about you, but that, that convicts me. That when you do things, you could be busy doing your programs, achieving your goals, having a lot of people, but if you're not praying, Jesus says, that's not my house. That's your house. Don't be involved, busy. Don't be so busy doing things for God that you forget God. That we do what we do for his glory, for his kingdom. And as the song that was sung, it's not about us. It's about him. How do we keep the main thing the main thing? We keep the main thing, the main thing, by making sure that we spend time in prayer. Don't just achieve your goals. Make sure that your goals are received from God. Now, again, Daniel Henderson, I keep referring back to this book, 
Uh, it says ministry can actually be achieved quite impressively in today's society. I mean, that's true, right? Fortune 500 companies, they, they achieve their goals all the time. Entertainment industry, uh, Disneyland, cults, they achieve their goals all the time. Yes, but the old paths that lead to new power compels us to embrace ministry as something to be received. So it's not, God, these are my plans, and God, please bless it. No, it's God, what is your plan for this church? God, what is your plan for my life? Because when we receive God's plan, then it is already blessed. It is not simply, God, this is what I want to do. Put your stamp of approval on it. In all that we do, in all that we do, make sure that it's something that we receive from God and not something that we simply achieve on our own. Remember what Dr. Hendricks said, if you could do it without prayer, is it really worth doing? What do we learn? We need to keep the main thing the main thing. We need to, be dedicate, we need to dedicate ourselves to the, to the preaching of God's word, to the teaching of God's word. There's dedication to preaching. We need to, to serve. There needs to be delegation of personnel. We need to serve in a godly manner. We need to be served. We need to serve under the control of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there needs to be devotion to prayer. There needs to be devotion prayer to prayer. You want to grow as a Christian, you want to, you want to grow as a church, then we need to prioritize God's word, spend time reading God's word. We need to serve. We need to use our, the gifts that God has given us to serve. And we need to pray so that we can continually mature and grow in the Christian life. I love what Jesus said to, to the disciples when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He took them there as his custom to pray. Instead of praying, you know what the disciples did? They slept. <laughs> and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, sound asleep. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? And by the way, before you criticize Peter, try praying one hour straight. And see how long before you give up or how long before you fall asleep. But here's my point. If we could spend two, three, four hours watching Netflix, playing golf, riding bikes, watching movies, playing video games. Can we not spend one hour in prayer meeting as a church? Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, then this, this is the verse that I want you to apply. It says in Acts 6, 7, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, there were about 8,000 priests at that time, became obedient to the faith. Simply being religious is not enough. You must put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Religion is good. It will tell you that there's right and wrong, but it will not give you the power to do what's right. Religion is good. It'll tell you there's a heaven and a hell, but it will not give you the power to go to heaven. Only faith in Jesus Christ will get you to heaven. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I invite you to come to him right now in the quietness of this moment. right where you're seated. Just pray the simple prayer. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I here and now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who prayed to receive Christ, and I pray that you would help them to grow in their faith in you. If you are a believer and you pray that prayer in the past, you are you're a child of God, maybe God is just calling you back to keep the main thing the main thing. Maybe you need to spend more time reading his word or listening to, to his word and, and making 
Sunday a priority. Maybe it's, it's to serve. Maybe God has been calling you to a particular ministry and you keep say, putting it off and saying, no, oh, some other time. Uh, just understand that the church walks with a limp because you're not doing what you need to do, what you're supposed to be doing. And, and maybe it's, it's in this whole area of prayer. I, I would challenge you that, and me as well, that let's make the rest of this year, make sure that this year the Faith Bible Church of Vallejo is a house of prayer. That it is not our house. That it is God's house. Father, I thank you for the decisions and the commitments that have been made through the convicting work of your spirit. And we ask for forgiveness, Lord. We ask for forgiveness because many times we try to do things on our own. And many times we get so busy or get so distracted that we forget you. And as a result, we miss out. We miss out on your blessings. And so I pray, Father, that you would do a work of grace in each of our hearts, in each of our lives. And that you would bless our church, Lord, as we enter into our 30th year of ministry. That, Father, may it be said that Faith Bible Church of Vallejo is a house of prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, let's all rise and let's all sing our, our uh, closing song. Let's ask the worship team to come up.